This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Studies in Pessimism by Arthur Schopenhauer Chapter 3 On Suicide As far as I know, none but the votaries of monotheistic, that is to say, Jewish religions, look upon suicide as a crime. This is all the more striking, inasmuch as neither in the Old nor in the New Testament is there to be found any prohibition or positive disapproval of it, so that religious teachers are forced to base their condemnation of suicide on philosophical grounds of their own invention. These are so very bad that writers of this kind endeavor to make up for the weakness of their arguments by the strong terms in which they express their abhorrence of the practice. In other words, they declaim against it. They tell us that suicide is the greatest piece of cowardice, that only a madman could be guilty of it, and other insipidities of the same kind. Or else they make the nonsensical remark that suicide is wrong, when it is quite obvious that there is nothing in the world to which every man has a more unassailable title than to his own life and person. Suicide, as I have said, is actually accounted a crime, and a crime which, especially under the vulgar bigotry that prevails in England, is followed by an ignominious burial and the seizure of the man's property. And for that reason, in a case of suicide, the jury almost always brings in a verdict of insanity. Now, let the reader's own moral feelings decide as to whether or not suicide is a criminal act. Think of the impression that would be made upon you by the news that someone you know had committed the crime, say, of murder or theft, or been guilty of some act of cruelty or deception, and compare it with your feelings when you hear that he has met a voluntary death. While in the one case a lively sense of indignation and extreme resentment will be aroused, and you will call loudly for punishment or revenge, in the other you will be moved to grief and sympathy, and mingled with your thoughts will be admiration for his courage, rather than the moral disapproval which falls upon a wicked action. Who has not had acquaintances, friends, relations, who of their own will have left this world? And are these to be thought of with horror as criminals? Most emphatically, no. I am rather of opinion that the clergy should be challenged to explain what right they have to go into the pulpit, or take up their pens, and stamp as a crime and action, which many men, whom we hold in affection and honor, have committed, and to refuse an honorable burial to those who relinquish this world voluntarily. They have no biblical authority to boast of, as justifying their condemnation of suicide. Nay, not even any philosophical arguments that will hold water. And it must be understood that it is arguments we want, and that we will not be put off with mere phrases or words of abuse. If the criminal law forbids suicide, that is not an argument valid in the Church, and besides, the prohibition is ridiculous. For what penalty can frighten a man who is not afraid of death itself? If the law punishes people for trying to commit suicide, it is punishing the want of skill that makes the attempt a failure. The ancients, moreover, were very far from regarding the matter in that light. Pliny says, Life is not so desirable a thing as to be protracted at any cost. Whoever you are, you are sure to die, even though your life has been full of abomination and crime. The chief of all remedies for a troubled mind is the feeling that among the blessings which nature gives to man, there is none greater than an opportune death, and the best of it is that everyone can avail himself of it. And elsewhere the same writer declares, Not even to God are all things possible, for he could not compass his own death if he willed to die. And yet, in all the miseries of our earthly life, this is the best of his gifts to man. Nay, in Massilia and on the island of Seos, the man who could give valid reasons for relinquishing his life was handed the cup of hemlock by the magistrate, and that, too, in public. And in ancient times, how many heroes and wise men died a voluntary death? Aristotle, it is true, declared suicide to be an offense against the state, although not against the person. 
but in Stobaeus's exposition of the peripatetic philosophy there is the following remark. The good man should flee life when his misfortunes become too great. The bad man, also, when he is too prosperous. And similarly, so he will marry and beget children, and take part in the affairs of the state, and generally practice virtue and continue to live. And then, again, if need be, and at any time necessity compels him, he will depart to his place of refuge in the tomb. And we find that the Stoics actually praised suicide as a noble and heroic action, as hundreds of passages show. Above all, in the works of Seneca, who expresses the strongest approval of it. As is well known, the Hindus look upon suicide as a religious act, especially when it takes the form of self-immolation by widows, but also when it consists in casting oneself under the wheels of the chariot of the god at Juggernaut, or being eaten by crocodiles in the Ganges, or being drowned in the holy tanks in the temples, and so on. The same thing occurs on the stage, that mirror of life. For example, in L'Ophelon de la Chine, a celebrated Chinese play, almost all the noble characters end by suicide, without the slightest hint anywhere, or any impression being produced on the spectator, that they are committing a crime. And in our own theatre is much the same, Palmyra, for instance, in Mahomet, or Mortimer, in Maria Stuart, Othello, Countess Teretsky. Is Hamlet's monologue the meditation of a criminal? He merely declares that if we had any certainty of being annihilated by it, death would be infinitely preferable to the world as it is. But there lies the rub. The reasons advanced against suicide by the clergy of monotheistic, that is to say, Jewish religions, and by those philosophers who adapt themselves thereto, are weak sophisms which can easily be refuted. The most thoroughgoing refutation of them is given by Hume in his essay on suicide. This did not appear until after his death, when it was immediately suppressed, owing to the scandalous bigotry and outrageous ecclesiastical tyranny that prevailed in England. And hence, only a very few copies of it were sold under cover of secrecy and at a high price. This and another treatise by that great man have come to us from Basel, and we may be thankful for the reprint. It is a great disgrace to the English nation that a purely philosophical treatise, which, proceeding from one of the first thinkers and writers in England, aimed at refuting the current arguments against suicide by the light of cold reason, should be forced to sneak about in that country, as though it were some rascally production, until at last it found refuge on the continent. At the same time it shows what a good conscience the Church has in such matters. In my chief work, I have explained the only valid reason existing against suicide on the score of morality. It is this, that suicide thwarts the attainment of the highest moral aim by the fact that, for a real release from this world of misery, it substitutes one that is merely apparent. But from a mistake to a crime is a far cry, and it is as a crime that the clergy of Christendom wish us to regard suicide. Translator's Note Schopenhauer refers to Die Welt aus Wille und Vorstellung, Volume 1, Section 69, where the reader may find the same argument stated at somewhat greater length. According to Schopenhauer, moral freedom, the highest ethical aim, is to be obtained only by a denial of the will to live. Far from being a denial, suicide is an emphatic assertion of this will, for it is in fleeing from the pleasures, not the sufferings of life that this denial consists. When a man destroys his existence as an individual, he is not by any means destroying his will to live. On the contrary, he would like to live if he could do so with satisfaction to himself, if he could assert his will against the power of circumstance. But circumstance is too strong for him. End footnote. The inmost kernel of Christianity is the truth that suffering, the cross, is the real end and object of life. Hence, Christianity condemns suicide as thwarting this end, whilst in the ancient world, taking a lower point of view, held it in approval, nay, in honor. But if that is to be accounted a valid reason against suicide, 
it involves the recognition of asceticism. That is to say, it is valid only from a much higher ethical standpoint than has ever been adopted by moral philosophers in Europe. If we abandon that high standpoint, there is no tenable reason left, on the score of morality, for condemning suicide. The extraordinary energy and zeal with which the clergy of monotheistic religions attack suicide is not supported either by any passages in the Bible or by any considerations of weight, so that it looks as though they must have some secret reason for their contention. May it not be this, that the voluntary surrender of life is a bad compliment for him who said that all things were very good? If this is so, it offers another instance of the crass optimism of these religions, denouncing suicide to escape being denounced by it. It will generally be found that, as soon as the terrors of life reach the point at which they outweigh the terrors of death, a man will put an end to his life. But the terrors of death offer considerable resistance. They stand like a sentinel at the gate leading out of this world. Perhaps there is no man alive who would not have already put an end to his life, if this end had been of a purely negative character, a sudden stoppage of existence. There is something positive about it. It is the destruction of the body, and a man shrinks from that, because his body is the manifestation of the will to live. However, the struggle with that sentinel is, as a rule, not so hard as it may seem from a long way off, mainly in consequence of the antagonism between the ills of the body and the ills of the mind. If we are in great bodily pain, or the pain lasts a long time, we become indifferent to other troubles. All we think about is to get well. In the same way, great mental suffering makes us insensible to bodily pain. We despise it. Nay, if it should outweigh the other, it distracts our thoughts, and we welcome it as a pause in mental suffering. It is this feeling that makes suicide easy, for the bodily pain that accompanies it loses all significance in the eyes of one who is tortured by an excess of mental suffering. This is especially evident in the case of those who are driven to suicide by some purely morbid and exaggerated ill-humor. No special effort to overcome their feelings is necessary, nor do such people require to be worked up in order to take the step. But as soon as the keeper, into whose charge they are given, leaves them for a couple of minutes, they quickly bring their life to an end. When in some dreadful and ghastly dream, we reach the moment of greatest horror, it awakes us, thereby banishing all the hideous shapes that were born of the night. And life is a dream, when the moment of greatest horror compels us to break it off. The same thing happens. Suicide may also be regarded as an experiment, a question which man puts to nature trying to force her to an answer. The question is this, what change will death produce in a man's existence, and in his insight into the nature of things? It is a clumsy experiment to make, for it involves the destruction of the very consciousness which puts the question and awaits the answer. End Chapter 3 this recording is in the public domain.